2833 was a relatively quiet year within the coreward half of the Inner Sphere, with the only point of note being the formation of the last cowboys within the Lyran Commonwealth. The Capellan Confederation, by contrast, was a hive of activity. On the Maddock front, fighting had never really paused after blacksmith commenced. The Seacalf was able to successfully push the invaders back off Vontebren, but soon after, House Orloff launched their own offensive, Operation Stevedor. Liao struggled to mount much of a resistance, as the FWLM completely eradicated the Capellan garrison at their primary targets, while their raiders made their own opportunistic gains after encountering minimal resistance. The Federated Sun's Department of Military Intelligence was analysing the successes and failures of Operation Lion the previous year, and believed their follow-up campaign, Operation Leopard, had a better chance of victory. The AWFS began by launching diversionary attacks against every commonality they bordered, while they once again called on General Greer to lead the invasion of Tikhonov. The supporting actions began promisingly, already annexing two planets by the time the second battle for Tikhonov began in May. This time, the ground forces were far more substantial, reinforced with additional artillery and aircraft. They quickly blasted their way into the High Kremlin through a vulnerable bastion, securing the complex on the 20th. A tactical blunder by the Seacalf at Tikograd meant that they lost control of their last defensible position early in the campaign. Though the majority of the garrison escaped into the hills and proved too elusive to track down, all significant population centres were firmly under Greer's control. The arrival of the Prefectorate Guard at a pirate point on June 13th caught the Davian general unprepared. Surgical strikes on their supply depots, coupled with a populace that was vehemently opposed to rendering any assistance, meant that the invaders soon found themselves in an undesirable position. The MIIO was reporting a far greater Liao relief force heading their way. With their odds of success collapsing, Greer ordered his troops to withdraw. Paul Davian was apoplectic at his decision to give up such a defensible position when his troops were still in good shape. The general was reassigned to work as a kitchen porter on New Certis for the next 18 months. Operation Leopard was still going on elsewhere, with the diversionary forces striking at another two worlds in October, capturing both by the end of the year. These two salients would be the sole acquisitions of the operation, however, as the other systems at Bell, Lee and Shoreham were all held by the Capellans. Undeterred by two successive failures, Davian planned to make one final effort to seize Tikhonov in the new year. The last actions of 2833 took place along the Madak Liao border. The Free Wells League launched Operation Attract, a multi year campaign aimed at expanding the Duchy of Andurian at the commonality's expense. Their first two moves against Katla and Leda went well, and the following year, Kursa and Matis Gogan were added to the hall. This was not the only campaign the Captain General was initiating against the Capellan Confederation in 2834. Comstar had supplied Charles with information on the handful of systems that lay between the Duchy of Oriente and the Liao capital. Operation Hawk would hopefully establish another salient into the Cyan commonality, from which they could launch a decisive blow against the Forbidden City on the Confederation's most important world. What should have been an easy victory turned into a rout, as unexpectedly stiff opposition drove them off all but one of the targeted planets, and a counterattack at their staging ground on Xuanwan soon saw the system revert back to Liao control. Operation Puma was to be the Federated Sun's last attempt to seize the world of Tikhonov. This time, the assault would be led by General Jessica Basna, who had successfully repulsed the attack on Chesterton back in 2828. As before, a diversionary assault would draw forces rimward, with their targets this time being along the Sarna-Capella commonality border. 
The attacks began simultaneously in April, and the two Capella systems fell to the Federated Suns within the month. Basna's assault proved equally promising, with all objectives Bartikograd secured by the fourth week. The invaders set up for a long siege and awaited their reinforcements. While House Kurita had been rebuilding their compromised communications network, they had been eyeing up the increasingly vulnerable Draconis March along their Rimward border. Paul Davian's obsession with conquering the Capellan Confederation had resulted in a great many troops being shifted over to that front. While Crucis March forces had been sent forward to fill the gaps, the defenders were still stretched thin. Somur was the only system to change hands since the code-breaking debacle, but now Jinjiro Kurita sensed an opportunity. On August 2nd, he gave the go order for Operation Moonlight Sonata. Several of the strikes deep into the Crucis March had no intention of taking control of the system, but rather causing as much destruction as possible. Resistance to the invasion proved unexpectedly fierce. Dobson and New Iverson may have fallen quickly, but the AFFS fought tooth and nail to hold on to their land everywhere else. Reinforcements sent to Barlow's End very nearly destroyed the Combine forces entirely, though they had to concede defeat in the end. Davian had only just hired on the Scrap Metal Mercenary Regiment, adding to the list of units they had to contend with. The DCMS cut their losses early and withdrew from the other systems, but Moonlight Sonata was a multi-year operation. The Dragon would soon return. While the Federated Suns had defended itself well, the attack came at the worst possible time and had far-reaching consequences. The Davian guards on Sanalak were in the middle of loading into their dropships for redeployment elsewhere when the Combine struck and inflicted horrendous casualties on the unprepared unit. The Davian guards had to abandon their mission afterwards. That mission was none other than Operation Puma, where they were set to reinforce Jessica Basna on Tikhonov. On July 2nd, the general learned that the aid she was counting on would not be coming. Capellan jumpships had already entered the system to spy on what forces were present, so she knew Seacaff reinforcements were imminent. While they could have withdrawn into the High Kremlin and tried to wait for another Davian unit to relieve them, her light and medium mechs were not well suited for a static defence. The decision was ultimately made for her when the First Prince called for a retreat. His orders arrived just as the Northwind Highlanders did. Kurgawa's blood lances held the line while the Deneb light cavalry pulled back to their ships, but the mercenaries were completely wiped out in the effort. The old SLDF unit wouldn't have long to recuperate before they were tracked to Olmak and finished off by more of the Highlanders. The next year, Lorelli Liao formed Hamilton's Highlanders from veterans of the Tikhonov battles to help fortify her borders from any further Davian aggression. The third successive loss at Tikhonov and the subsequent collapse of Operation Puma at Akala and Highspire heaped enormous pressure on Paul Davian at the royal court. His political opponents argued that had they sent their entire force to Tikhonov during any of the three attempts, there was no doubt the commonality capital would now belong to the Federated Sons. The First Prince understood that such a move would have left their borders exposed to swift retaliation, potentially losing more ground than they would gain, even with control of the massive industrial complexes in and around Tikhograd. Nevertheless, he was forced to give up on his personal ambitions and take a more measured approach to the conflict. Across the Confederation, the Andurian commonality was still hemorrhaging worlds to House Humphrey's Operation Attract. The Free Wells League was on the charge, and that year the Marek Militia reformed their 23rd Regiment, lost in the early years of the First Succession War. Word had made it back to the Captain General that the interior worlds of the Furillo province were particularly vulnerable at that moment. Jeanette Marek had passed on information about the Archon's use of citizen regiments to reinforce the front. The FWLM felt confident that they could bypass these and launch a series of damaging raids deep into the Commonwealth. 
Operation Brum struck at a trio of supposedly undefended systems towards the provincial capital, and ran straight into frontline combat troops that smashed the raiders before they could cause any damage. The abject failure of Brum only added to the Captain General's growing suspicion that there was a leak somewhere in his intelligence network. Every operation his military undertook either led to easy victories or humiliating defeats. He tasked the head of SAFE, Morgan DeWitt, with finding those responsible. But somewhere in his mind, Charles must have feared that the actual culprit was his secret ally, Comstar. The Draconis Combine continued their deep raids into the Crucis March as part of Operation Moonlight Sonata throughout 2835. Their first target, Strawn, was all the way in the New Avalon combat region. The garrison was nearly wiped out before the DCMS withdrew just as reinforcements touched down. Listowel was next, with both sides chasing each other through the mountains before the Curitans called it quits in July. The December raid on Shalam was the most damaging, as several industrial plants were destroyed, though the DCMS regiment was savaged in the process. The attacks had one unintended consequence that the Combine forces in that region would have to deal with going forwards. Chain gang mission survivors, who had been living in the Draconis March for the past decade, declared their intent to resist further Kuritan aggression, coming together to form the Everfree Mercenary Regiment. Likewise, the AWFS also formed the Panzer Brigade that year to further bolster the region's defense. The Federated Sons was not Jinjiro's only target in 2835, as Operation Chopin would also commence that year. The first phase was to hit a trio of vital industrial centers within the Tamar Pact and Federation of Sky. The fiercest fighting within each nation took place at Kobe and Kessel. There, the battles descended into a true meat grinder. Though the Lyrans claimed victory both times, their heavy and assault mechs had been shown up by the more maneuverable Kuritan forces. The Draconis Combine had not lost any territory since the beginning of the war, and by all accounts should have been feeling confident about their future prospects. Instead, they were entering a period of fear and uncertainty. By late 2835, Jinjiro Kurita had almost completely lost control of his psyche. Until this point, he had relied on his innate military expertise to see the realm through the tumultuous 29th century, but by now, he was barely able to function. His half-brother, Zabu Kurita, would increasingly have to step in as acting coordinator and report on developments to Jinjiro during his few lucid moments. As was the case during the First Succession War, the periphery played no significant part in the Second, probably even less so. The only notable development came in 2835, when tensions within the Outworlds Alliance broke the nation in two. The Spinward half of the realm was largely populated by immigrants from the Terran hegemony, settled during the heady days of the Star League. Though they maintained a civil relationship with the older colonists, of whom many had died fighting their ancestors in the Reunification War, the periphery uprising that precipitated the fall of the Star League divided the Alliance into two camps. When the Alpharat's government seemed unwilling or unable to stave off the pirates preying on the outermost colonies, which had already led to the abandonment of more than two dozen worlds, Trader's Domain decided that enough was enough. Led by the provincial capital Winds Roost, in 2835 they declared themselves an independent state, no longer part of House Avalar territory. Trader's Domain faced an uphill battle, as evidenced by the fact that the Alliance Military Corps would lose both their Balagora defenders and the Remora Guards to pirate activity during the Second Succession War, and the new microstate had far less in the way of defences. The internecine fighting that plagued the region would infect their own systems in due course. Survival on the fringes of human space might soon prove too great a challenge. C 
Since the end of the Davian Big Cat offensives, Duke Damian Hasek had been conducting his own private war against the Confederation, Operation Tiger. This was nothing more than a widespread raiding campaign, beginning in late 2834 and continuing into 37. It proved effective in keeping the CCAF on the defensive, and at no point did Chancellor Lorelli Liao have the opportunity to reclaim any of the worlds she had lost to the Capellan March. The Bloody Sons were favourites of his, dispatched to Galitzin and even the commonality capital, St. Ives. Two systems were affected by the raids more than the others, Genf and Kai. The attacks proved to be the death knell for both colonies. Neither would survive the war. Across on the other side of the Confederation, Operation Attract was concluding with the capture of Viribium and Aquagia. In both instances, the CCAF had given Duke Jonathan Humphrey's forces a bloody nose before withdrawing, enough for them to think twice about continuing the campaign. The last move in the region came when the Free World's guards seized a great bounty of spare parts from the mech factories on Shiro 3. Twenty-eight thirty-six also saw the last actions of Moonlight Sonata, with two raids into the Woodbine operational area and a hard-won victory over the Draconis March militia on Tishomingo. The DCMS had largely discounted the garrison as posing any real threat, but they fought so tenaciously that the seventeen survivors were treated more like heroes than prisoners of war after the fighting concluded. Not knowing when the assault would cease. The Robinson Rangers raised a second regiment that year to help in the defence of their homeworld. Operation Chopin would also move towards its climactic finale in 2836, the Fourth Battle of Hesperus. As grand as a return to this hyper-industrial planet sounded on paper, in reality, the assault force led by Taisho Satoshi Anderson stood little chance of success. Fewer units were dispatched than had taken part in the infamous first battle, and by 2837, the Taisho was preparing to deploy nuclear weapons in a last-ditch effort to achieve his objectives. Zabu Kurita instead refused his request to use WMDs, forcing the DCMS to withdraw. Anderson's decision to commit seppuku upon his return proved a rallying cry for the warlords of the Draconis Combine. In their estimation, Zabu lacked the guts needed to make the tough calls. If he were to succeed Jinjiro as coordinator, which looked likely, the fate of the realm would be in jeopardy. They would need to take action. And there we have it guys, that's one more chapter complete. We're coming up on the halfway point in this series, I think in terms of overall runtime, we're just shy of it. This chapter also marks the end of the first phase of the war. A lot of operations taking place across all the borders, everyone being very aggressive with their moves uh, and throwing their forces into the fire. We don't have particularly accurate figures for when units are destroyed in the second war compared to the first. But behind the scenes here, uh, everyone's waking up to the reality that oh, we are very quickly going to lose the ability to defend ourselves, let alone uh, conduct offensive operations. In fact, it's already happening in the uh, Capellan Confederation. We're also seeing a, a perilous situation develop in the Draconis Combine, and we're going to get much more into that in the upcoming chapters. Next time, there's going to be a, a crucial turning point in their history, uh, but things only get more complicated and convoluted as it goes on from there. Thank you once again for watching, I will be back soon with another video. If you want to make sure you don't miss that, subscribe to the channel. If you want to support me, you can leave me a like or leave me a comment. Uh, the, both of those help with the algorithm and I enjoy reading all of your comments. I try to respond to as many as I can. If you want to go further than that, there is a Patreon linked in the description below, uh, but that's up to yourselves. Thanks again guys, and I'll hope to see you soon for another video.